Sean Strickland. Oh, here's the thing, you guys. The man with the most confronting and conflicting personality in this sport. When hearing about Strickland, you'll hear a lot of labels. Racist. Oh, work harder. No food for you till you finish. Sexist. I think as a collective man group, we need to elect somebody that's going to put women back in the kitchen. Homophobic. Wait, are you, are, you a, are you a homosexual? I am not. To the unknown person, he might seem like an awful guy, but to everyone else, we know he is incredibly based. But behind the unhinged personality is a sad story of a troubled childhood filled with abuse and trauma, which created the unstable but relatable and raw personality that we have in front of us today. However, recent events seem to have shifted the narrative around the American loudmouth from the unhinged psycho where anything goes to the hypocrite that can deal it but not take it. In this short documentary, I am to peel back the mask and try to understand the conflicting personalities and the troubled past of the middleweight champion. I also try to make sense of the recent back and forth between Strickland, Duplessy and Ian Gary and understand the reaction from Strickland and where this shift in attitude surrounding the line around trash talk came from. From an abusive home to fighting in the gym, to the middleweight champion about to defend his title. It's been a hell of a ride. This is the incomplete story of Sean Strickland. I think it's important before we look at the present day version of Strickland to go back to where this person was created and the events that transpired to cause someone to be the way that Sean is. Strickland grew up in Corona, California and it's safe to say he didn't have a good childhood. Sean has talked about routine abuse from his father being both mental and physical, and that's something that he endured for years growing up. Day in, day out, from like my earliest memory, like my dad was nuts. The psychological trauma of like living this life. Every night, I would like, I would go to bed thinking my mom's gonna die tonight, you know? It's not thought my mom like me strangling her, and he's like, you're gonna die. So I go and I grab the guitar, and I just smack him in the head as far as I can. And I grab the phone, and I run out, and I call the cops. I don't think it can be fully understood by the common person just how much this will affect you. Whenever you experience like things like that day in and day out, your brain, like it, it biological changes. When children are having um, repeated traumatic events, there is an overabundance of that stress hormone in the brain, and we know that that causes actual damage to the development of the structures of the brain. Children who have been traumatized, particularly from their primary caregiver, um, have really disorganized attachment because the person from whom they're going to go to feels safe, to learn trust, to learn that the world is a predictable and loving place, is also the person that is um, perpetrating this scary and traumatic event on them. These experiences are not normal. Some people may have experienced a bit of trauma or been hit as a kid and talk about it not being as big of a deal when it extends beyond the spanking and into over a decade of hell as a child that has serious effects on the victim. We know that adults who in childhood experience six or more adverse events will have a life expectancy that's 20 years less than the average life expectancy. A house poisoned by drugs, alcohol, gambling and an unhealthy marriage are all the ingredients for a damaged child to go down the wrong path and end up in prison. I had a teacher tell me in like 7th, 8th grade, one of the, one of the few years I went to school, she, I think it was like, her name was like Miss Watched, I don't know, history or some shit. She looked at me, she said, Sean, you're the, re you're the reason why they build prisons. Sean broke the cycle though, and he found his way out of the pain and discovered solace in martial arts. Uh, my mom took me to uh, Empire of May with a guy named Paul Pereira. Like I never, like, I don't think I ever really experienced happiness until that day. So you gotta understand, like, you, you live your whole life in a certain mindset and then you do something and then you're just like, this is what normal people experience? I love this. I remember like crying, like after I got done sparring, like I even know when I think about it, it makes my eyes water. He talked about how getting beat up at the gym was the first time that he truly felt happy. First day I trained there, man, I mean, I got the shit kicked out. I mean, I was so happy. I remember- I started training when I was around like 14, 15 and it was like with this therapy, you know? Like just helping with all my issues, like seeing the light. After discovering his passion for martial arts, Strickland worked his way through the regional scene and made it to the UFC. And he was just an average guy. Sean Strickland taking on Bubba McDaniel, a veteran of the sport, but you are as well. Maybe the UFC fans don't know you as much. You weren't on the Ultimate Fighter, but you have a great record. Came on from King of the Cage. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been around, but I finally got the opportunity to prove myself in the UFC, and I'm pretty excited. Can't wait for that opportunity. In my mind, I was registering, okay, Sean, throw a head kick. But you know when you're out there and you're in retard mode, I mean, pressure's down. I mean, you 
Soft spoken, refined, and although he had skills, he was just a 500 level fighter. Win two, lose, win three, lose, win, lose, win. He just simply couldn't hit his peak at welterweight. But then he hit a turning point, a near fatal motorcycle accident that resulted in two years on the sidelines and a near career ending leg injury. I had a lot of doctors. Every doctor I spoke to was telling me that, hey, you can fight for sure, but you probably shouldn't fight. So the hardest thing was just kind of telling these doctors to shut up. But then he came back and the man was completely unhinged. Ah, man, I want to fucking, you know, try to kill him, man, and get paid. I didn't even think morality exists in my brain, so why the fuck am I named after a Disney character? I was younger, had long hair, and everyone was like, oh, well, like, you, he's wild, he has long hair, Tarzan. It was fucking gay. I probably thought he'd get me laid when I was a dumb kid, and I'd, like, tell women that I'm emotional. I watch fucking Disney movies, suck my dick. The man spoke absolute insanity. I'm almost, I'm almost hoping Russia fucking nukes us, just so our fucking nuts get a little bigger. Saying he wanted to kill his opponents inside the cage, and even going after fellow fighters. If I kill someone in the ring, it fucking make me very happy. You, you mean that? Oh, I love it, absolutely. I think I told him I could rape him in prison one day and it bothered him. But I'm just saying the facts, dude. I'm just saying the fucking facts, man. If me and you were in a jail cell together and I wanted to, like, I could take that ass. He thunder thumbs himself, you guys. We're here. You know what, man? The moment I post the video of me jerking off my dog, they will, they will put some credibility to that. Following a second round TKO over Abu Magomedov and a JRE podcast to pitch his case for a title shot, and on top of that, an injury to the otherwise undoubtable next challenger, Strickland finally secured his title shot. With a month to prepare and having to fly halfway across the world, it seems like a tall task. And add on top of that, the nightmare style matchup and the prospect of victory seemed almost impossible. Strickland arrived down under and he took over the town instantly, sparring with fans punching strangers and saying his usual outrageous statements, the build-up was the Sean Strickland show. And after a verbal annihilation of Israel Adesanya at the press conference, he was already loved by the fans, but the 49-46 domination that he pitched 36 hours later to dethrone the heavily favoured champion catapulted him into orbit as a fan favourite. What was there not to like? He was unhinged, funny, and now humiliated one of the least liked fighters on the roster. And on top of that, he was now the champion of the world. Fast forward to UFC 296 build-up, and Ian Gary was in the news for all the wrong reasons. How many of you guys have fucked Ian Gary's wife? To everyone's delight, Strickland jumped on the train and started absolutely bullying Ian Gary and had them threatening lawsuits. Dude, I know you're going through some shit right now. I know that fucking you got preyed upon. I know all this shit, bro, and I'm here for you. Just give me a call if you need me. And this motherfucker, he says, I'm going to sue you if you don't fucking delete that. You're going to sue me, motherfucker. He said that I was lying. I ain't lying. You are 26. She is 40. She wrote a fucking book on how to be old and be with a young athlete. I ain't fucking lying, bro. This is factual. The fans loved him more than ever, and the upcoming press conference was just another excuse for him to bully anyone at will. You know, Colby is a fake fucking pussy. And if he was standing here right next to me, the only fucking thing he would do is call 911 because he is the definition of a fucking bitch. Motherfucker with a status. Trying to let dudes fuck his wife. <laughs> oh, I got a nerve. I see I hit a nerve there. Wait, what happened? Well, Drickers Duple C decided to Sean Strickland, Sean Strickland, and said this. Bro, you think your dad beat the shit out of you? You, you, you? Your dad doesn't have shit on me. I'm going to show you what it's like to Drag beat us. you. I mean, all, every child of memory you have is going to come back when I'm in there with you. Every single one, the one we lie in bed at night when your dad comes in. We hadn't seen this before. Someone actually sent the same heat back his way, and Sean actually seemed upset, angry, and frustrated, and truly annoyed at his opponent. Strickland appeared rattled. This was unusual, but maybe it was just in the moment. They would sort themselves out, everything would calm down. It'd be fine. Everything was gonna be okay. Well, I guess not. And now your main event has some heat to it. I will take your fucking soul, you understand me? When Strickland's public responded about his outburst and the reason behind his anger at Duplessis comments, it divided the fans down the middle. His claims about overstepping boundaries rubbed fans the wrong way, given his tendency to be a perpetual line crosser. A Brazilian fighter got hit by a fucking bus and died. No one gave a fuck about that guy. When I read it, I was like, God damn, dude, if you can't dodge a bus, that's why you're not in the UFC. 
What was wrong here? Why was a man that's willing to go anywhere and make fun of anyone unable to take heat back the same way? His subsequent podcast with Theo Vaughn drew more eyebrows as he broke down in tears when discussing his trauma that he went through as a child. Fans could certainly sympathise with his situation, but couldn't help but criticise Strickland for his current actions and statements, which certainly contradicted his past verbal dealings. There's some things that were off limits. You know, you don't really talk about a man's wife. Yeah. You don't really, you know, you don't talk about a man's wife. You don't talk about a man's kids. And you don't talk about, like, fucking a kid being abused. These things were all off limits. I went through, like, she got fucking ran through on the soccer scene. So she wrote a book on how to be a wag, on how to be a famous woman with an athlete, or how to be a woman with an athlete. Yeah. Bitch wrote a book about this like eight years, I don't know, eight years ago. Okay. The fan support for Sean Strickland seems to be ever so slightly shifting, and if he's not careful, it'll cross a tipping point, and he might just lose more. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. There was definitely an element of hypocrisy here. Sean Strickland sent shots at everyone. He made fun of dead fighters, criticized fighters' relationships and partners, made fun of fighters' coaches, media members alike, and fans loved him for it. No one saw an issue with anything he said. It was all fair game, it was all funny, and if you complained about it, take a joke and toughen up. But then this happened, and Strickland tried to rewrite the line that seemingly didn't exist with anything he said. If making fun of childhood trauma is too far, which it very well might be, then Sean Strickland certainly crossed the line on a few occasions. When Strickland made fun of Khalil Roundtree for being emotional and called him a pussy, that's fair game, but then he cries on a podcast. And by no means am I saying he shouldn't be able to cry about a serious issue that he suffered as a child. But then on the flip side, you can't criticise fighters for crying about issues that they see as difficult for them. But to look at it from a different perspective, everything Sean said in terms of trash talk to other fighters, he said relating to adult choices that they made. He's just making fun of them and the things that they do as an adult. Like Ian Gary, who's being hypocritical about the Neil Magny situation and chose to marry someone 14 years older. Or O'Malley, who chose to share his wife and talk about it on a podcast. Or Izzy, who just chooses to be a creep weirdo and touch his dog inappropriately. Those are all choices that they made and he's just criticising them for that. But when you make fun of someone for something that they had no choice over, like being abused as a child and growing up in a terrible situation, is that too far? That's up to you to decide. But regardless, it's definite to say that some of the things Strickland said have definitely come back to bite him. When connecting Strickland's reaction to Duplessis' comments and his childhood trauma, it raises some new questions. Why are you so angry? Why was Sean able to make jokes about his own situation, but then completely flip out when someone did the same? Most importantly, why does Sean appear to display two sides? He shows the brash, trash-talking, unhinged and jokeful side, but then behind the mask there is clearly a damaged man. Someone who went through something that is still, no matter how much they joke about it or put on a tough guy act, it will always sit with them and when emotions get real, sadness is one of the most real emotions to exist and that's what will come through in its purest form. The mask will come off and you will see who the person truly is. Sadhguru proposes the idea that there are two ways to deal with trauma, to become wise or become wounded. Uma, essentially you're finding an excuse for the way you are, which you yourself don't like. See, if something unpleasant happened to you, you have two choices. Either you can become wise or you can become wounded. Choose. More unpleasant things happen to you, happen to you than anybody else. You must be the wisest man soonest. No, you choose to be wounded because you carry this wound like a badge and so that you can cause the same wound to others. What's the point? When you know the pain of it, how do you do the same thing to me? I can certainly see the correlation with Strickland. He carries his trauma like a badge. It is part of his identity and at times he does speak about it in an insightful way and explain how it helped him grow in aspects. But at other times, it seems like the trauma and rage that he still carries builds up inside him and he can't help but deflect it onto other people and the world. Rightfully, some people ask why he jokes about it himself but got angry when someone else brought it up in a non-joking manner, and also why he talks about it so much if he doesn't want others bringing it up. But I believe he talks about it in that way, tells people about it as a coping mechanism. He tells people about it because he needs to get his feelings out there and tell people about what he went through so that they can understand him because he wants to be accepted which he probably wasn't for his childhood life. And as much as he probably doesn't want to say this, I think he jokes about it so that when it comes out, it doesn't come out how he did with Theo Von. 
Him calling Khalil Roundtree a pussy for crying is not so hypocritical as it is calling himself the same thing. He knows those emotions exist within him and he probably considers himself a pussy for opening up the way he did too. I'm no psychologist, but in my opinion, Sean jokes about his trauma to avoid confronting the deep effects that it truly has on him. When Drukas brought that up and it wasn't on Sean's terms, he confronted it head on and he wasn't able to swerve around the real effects that it had on him as a person. Him opening up on Theo Von gave me the same opinion. He didn't intend to open up as much as he did, but when he said- I remember like laying in bed, like I remember I stopped believing God, man. Like and then he truly thought about that. You could see the effect that it had on him when he really processed it, considered it, and remembered that time in his life. It confronted a realness and a sadness that you can't escape. Although he carries his trauma as such a big part of his personality, which anyone else who went through that would, I don't think he wants to live this life. I believe he's forced to talk and act the way he does because without the jokes, the anger and the insults, he's left with the part that he hates himself the most. The damaged part, the emotional part and the part that he wants to leave in the past 20 years ago when he was defenseless, scared and alone. He wants to get rid of that part, but he can't. It's who he is and without the realness, he's just an angry American that punches people in the face for a living. And even if he tells you that's what he is, we know he's a lot more than that. Sean Strickland's past is a complicated one. His emotions are complicated and his personality is complicated. But the one thing that isn't complicated is that he's a phenomenal fighter that is trying to secure his first title defense of a belt that no one saw him capturing in the first place. I'm sure there'll be much more in store, but when it comes to the odd nature of Sean Strickland and what he'll say and do next, we don't know. But for now, that's all we have on the man. Sean Strickland, the middleweight champion of the world.